morning everyone hope you and your loved ones are safe and doing well welcome to our second round table webinar the contemporary cfo a gatekeeper or a business strategist cfo's office bookkeepers or business enabler today cfos are not just gatekeeper of the organization but are actively driving business growth the new age cfos have outgrown traditional responsibilities and are driving business from the forefront what does it take to transform into the rapidly changing role of finance native is pleased to bring together finance professionals from varied industry backgrounds to understand the modern job description of a cfo and what does it take take to reach there i would like to introduce our esteemed panel here starting with dinesh thapar dinesh is currently the group cfo of reliance retail He's part of the senior leadership team and has been working on a range of business and corporate initiatives in what has been a prolific phase for the company over the last year. Prior to joining Reliance, he spent two decades with HWL where he held variety of leadership roles. A fellow chartered accountant and a gold medalist, Dinesh enjoys sports, EDM music, live concerts and loves to solve Mensa puzzles. Our next panelist, Gopal Mahadevan. Gopal is the CFO of Ashok Leland. Prior to joining Ashok, Gopal had led finance function of Thermax and Amar Raja Batteries. A fellow chartered accountant and company secretary, Gopal enjoys playing guitar, reading, and keeping in touch with the tech world. Next, I would like to introduce Harsh Shah. Harsh is currently the CEO of Invigrid. He is a prominent name in the world of invids and was instrumental in setting up Invigrid. Previously he served as CFO of Sterlite Power Transmission. He holds a master's degree in business administration and bachelor's degree in electrical engineering. He is a voracious reader and loves traveling. Our next panel member is Sandeep Kher. Sandeep is currently working with Sequoia Capital as director and head portfolio finance. He closely works with founders helping them create a sustainable value for the portfolio. Earlier he has worked with Max Life Insurance, SBI, Kotak amongst others. A fellow chartered accountant and a fitness enthusiast, he truly believes and practices the ideology of healthy and healthy eating habits. He loves reading and is passionate about cars. And last but not the least, on our panel is our moderator for today's session, Mr. Kalis Varan Arunachalam, aka Kalis. Kalis is the group CFO of Aisha Motors. He's part of the management of the most revered brands of all time, Royal Enfield Bullets. Prior to this, he was CFO of Future Lifestyle, where he's known to do a lot of work with Mr. Piani himself. A fellow chartered accountant and master's in business management, Kalis enjoys music and loves to travel. He's a diehard fan of cricket and ensures practicing cricket himself and never misses any game to watch. Welcome to the session, everybody. Before we start, just quick two instructions for our audience. For those logged in from mobile device, please swipe left or right to see the entire panel. Second, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to start sharing your questions. We will be taking them towards the second half of the session. And now over to you, Kalis, to commence this discussion. Thank you, Chavi and uh, good morning everyone and uh, thanks uh, thanks for taking your time out on a holiday and along with a long weekend uh, and also thanks for introducing to a super power pack panel uh, it's an interesting topic that we have on hand today uh, while it's not going to be a coffee with karan let me try to make it up as careers with kalish uh, for a change uh, i'm happy to be on the other side one of the easiest things to do is always to ask questions and i'm leaving the tough jobs to the super panelists that we have today uh, in, uh, as we go into the session. Uh, so as we start, what do you expect during the day? Uh, I can assure you that you're not going to hear anything about VUCA World. As much as we have talked about VUCA World in the last few years, uh, here we have a black swan event. We are still struggling to see how do we come out of it. Having said that, are we going to talk about anything around COVID management and what are we trying to do about that? Again, a no, we're not going to hear about that also. And neither it's going to be anything technical about compliance, audit or accounting. Then what are we here for? Lastly, we want to discuss as a modern day CFO, you're expected to don multiple roles at the same point of time. And as much as we would like to call a CFO as a business partner, I also think CFO is moving towards 
maybe what we call as a deputy CEO role already. And in this context, we have seen a lot of trends that's moving in the right direction, led by digital transformation, data, and more importantly, leadership skills and software aspects. Uh, is that all what we have? There's enough fun elements also that has been kept in for the session. There'll be a few rapid fire questions for our panelists and let's make it fun as we go forward into it. And I can assure you that Native is already getting in coffee hampers for the winners. Uh, as we move in and as we have seen uh, what our government is doing in, we'll also start with something called as a monkey bar. And uh, let me try to go to each of the panelists and ask about a few things of what's happening off late with them and how are they going about it. Uh, let me take the opportunity to start with Gopal. Uh, Gopal, what is that one household task that you think you have become good at during lockdown and why? Gopal, you are on mute. Sorry, guys. Hi. Good morning to all of you. Uh, uh, thank you for this wonderful opportunity actually to share uh, the screen and multiple screens with uh, some very cutting edge professionals. The one household task that I'm good at, which I was good at before uh, I got married, was cooking. And after that, I was forbidden to come inside the kitchen at Will, Vim and Fancy. I kind of decided to get back to my culinary uh, skills. And I found that they are very much intact. And now I have the risk of actually taking over the kitchen, which I don't want to, given the kind of uh, conf calls that we have to do. But really great. Cooking is a de really kind of a de-stressor, yeah. Absolutely. I, I shared that uh, task along with you, Gopal. So happy to uh, appreciate and share that with you. And as we move on, Gopal, uh, there is a trend of under 40 CFOs that you have been seeing. What is your view on that? And do you think it's a good change that's happening? I, I think it's important because you see, technology is getting younger and younger. The Moore's law is getting broken. So there is no reason for CFOs, CEOs, CXOs. Uh, to all be, uh, you know, uh, having to have experience only with age. I think experience comes with the kind of exposure that one gets. And the younger generation is definitely much faster, off the block, radical. Um, and, you know, they, they know how to manage this stuff. So I think it's a good trend to have. What they would need to do, however, is to ensure that the traditional role of the CFO, which still exists, you know, the traditional role of the CFO starts coming in when things go wrong. When things are booming and everything is rocking, right? That is when the other CFO is there who is supposed to do business enablement, ensure that he's doing partnership, getting the decks cleared for uh, product launches, for diversification, for M&A, et cetera. Excellent. Which is super crucial. But right. one also needs to know that at the back of it, there is the other side of the moon that one should always keep a track on. So right. I would only kind of... Uh, you know, kind of request that the younger yeah. folks, and they are, some of them are super smart, let me tell you that. Yeah. And uh, I think they should also see to it that the other part of the CFO's role is also kind of well touched upon. That's about it. Otherwise, I think those guys are rocking here. Yeah. I agree, Gopal. In fact, as you rightly said, uh, the bread and butter of traditional finance uh, cannot be replaced by any other vertical or person other than the finance professionals. So very well summarized. And uh, on that note, had you not become a CFO, uh, what would Gopal be? Well, I wanted to actually to be in uh, advertising. Uh, I was an inter-school uh, college uh, cartooning competition winner at the college right. level. Right. Um, and uh, my father was in advertising, so I actually wanted to do that. Fortunately or unfortunately, I cleared the CA entrance exam when I was doing my 12th, and the whole thing changed. Oh, okay. Right. Thanks, thanks, Gopal. Those were pretty candid answers. Uh, moving on to Dinesh. Dinesh, I think you have made a fabulous transition uh, from an MNC organization uh, to one of the revered Indian organization at this point of time. But that's all fine. What's your wife take on this? Your wife likes the Dinesh of HUL or the Dinesh of Reliance? Okay, interesting question. Uh, good morning, first of all. That's very upset. And uh, thank you to Native. It's an absolute pleasure to be on this panel today and to really be able to share my views. Uh, yeah, so what does my wife think? I think, does she have a choice? Probably not, I'd like to believe. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think in the HUL days, she'd probably say you were largely out, but still seen. Uh, in the recent days, and this is the recency effect that might be at play, she'd probably say you're largely seen, but still out. Uh -huh. uh, 
and and therefore, uh, but what what hasn't changed? I think she she recognizes the rest of the family recognizes was that work's always been the first love, and if at all, this move has only reinforced that. Fabulous, right? And uh, how does your daily routine look like, Dinesh? Well, I guess it's been it's been very different in, in in the COVID world. So let me spend some time on it at the moment. I think. Uh, 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 you know, I'm normally a sort of person who likes to be completely abreast of what's happening in the world. So if I don't get my daily dose of news uh, uh, through the day, you know, uh, just one just felt, feels a bit lost. So I really start my day. You know, I I, I claim that uh, starting my day with tech, I don't have I don't have a problem with starting off getting up, looking at tech and just ensuring I stay abreast. So I look up a little bit of mail. I look up uh, what's happening in the world of news, spend some quality time doing a little bit of reading. And then, of course, the rest of the day gets taken away into, into meetings, into huddles, and I think just into connecting with people. Uh, spend some time uh, exercising intermittently. And I think the two things that I've tried to do slightly differently in, in times like this is that a lot of the work has now become sedentary because you almost end up sitting. You know, my earlier style was to walk around uh, quite a proponent of management by walking around, you know, just walk around on, onto floors, kind of connect with people. And I think there's a lot that you pick up and you build and forge connections that way, which obviously in, in the current day and age you can't do. Uh, so therefore I've adapted a little bit to try and intersperse my day with meetings. I would probably end up wearing a leisure way, getting into sneakers, you know, doing a few meetings while doing stationary jogging, walking, you know, so a little bit of that. So I focus on fitness as one distinctive piece far more consciously in times like this. And the second, I think, is to really stay very connected uh, and right. engaged uh, with people. Yeah, because yeah. it's not just me, you know, all of us at this point of time don't have uh, a natural uh, environment where which facilitates interaction and therefore how do you stay connected with people, especially people all the way down the line. And I really wish I could have done so much more of it because there's never an end to how much you can uh, do on this front. But these are the two distinctive things that I think I would have changed in a time like this. The fitness element becoming far more conscious and, and integrated into the day and uh, a very conscious effort to reach out consciously and stay connected and engaged uh, with, with the team, which by the way is a very large team. And therefore, uh, you know, for me, it's just important that people all the way down the line still stay connected with what's happening. Yeah, well said, uh, Dinesh. Actually, uh, as much as we try to make our presence felt virtually, uh, it's yeah. the emotional connect that we need to have with our teams, which is one of the things that's been missing at this point of time. But I'm sure we all are finding our own ways to keep that going. Excellent. Sure, I think this is when adaptability has clearly come to the fore, and I think uh, one right. of us are far more adaptable than we believed we were before this. Absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. And uh, what is the one best compliment that you have ever received, Dinesh? Okay, it's uh, you know it's interesting, and uh, when you when you think of this, I think it just goes back to a sense of purpose. I think my sense of purpose is very clearly anchored around making a difference to people, right? Uh, uh, when I hang up my boots, I want to be remembered to make a difference to people. Uh, in my mind, I think a lot of the professional achievements will go down in the ends of history and get rewritten each year as the calendar uh, is reset. Uh, but to me, I think that's the one thing. So every time when I end up connecting with people, mentoring them, coaching them, helping a few of them uh, provocatively find their way or, or, or really find their course on, onto something and someone tells me he's, that I made a difference to what they've done uh, or to their lives, I think that to me is probably the most satisfying piece. Uh, and like I said, connects very well back and very consistent with, with my mission. Excellent. Uh, thanks, Dinesh. Uh, let me take the opportunity to move on to Sandeep right now. Uh, Sandeep, what is the one advice that you would like to give to someone who has just cleared his chart accountancy course? First of all, um, you know, thank you, Nirev, for for doing this. Uh, I think it's a it's a great topic, and outside of of all the things that you know we've been doing, so so good to kind of you know come come to a platform on a, on a Friday, which is a holiday and share some of our, our thoughts and, and learnings around, uh, you know, what it takes to become a, 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 a better CFO and a better human being. Uh, so thank you for this. Uh, I think, you know, if, as I look back at, at, at my own career, um, yeah, you know, there are a few things and not just one, I mean, maybe I'll take the liberty of kind of moving away from, from the question a little bit and, and not stick to that one sentence, but maybe, you know, play out, um, three things that I would advise all young folks, not just people who just cleared CN are looking out to start their careers. I think today, when I look at people, I think there's this, this general tendency of, you know, uh, getting results and success very, very quickly. Uh, I think one advice that I will, I will definitely want to leave on the table is, uh, you know, there is no need to rush. I think everyone starts, starts small. Uh, all of us have time. Uh, and, 
and and i think you will you will get where you want to be uh, so there's no need to rush i think i think the second thing is uh, you know that i would want to share with people is that you know you, you're not supposed to have it all, all figured out from day one uh, i think uh, we, all all of you have to make efforts today and hope that all your sacrifices and the, and the and the patience that you are showing uh, off will pay off in the future worrying so much about things that are yet to happen will only slow you down so i think that's the second piece that i would want to leave and i think third which i thought that i did not do enough when i was uh, you know i had started out was uh, going out and exploring beyond work uh, i thought you know i was deeply truly immersed in work and that's what my only world looked like to me at that point of time uh, i think uh, i think we should not deprive ourselves the chance to experience and feel and things and do things that are truly you know meaningful and have purpose outside of your work domain i think those are the three things that you know i would call out for folks to to specifically ponder over and think as they start building their career excellent agree with you uh, sandeep i think eventually it's a marathon that we are running and not a sprint and always be aware about uh, what's your circle of influence and not keep worrying about things outside your perspective well said uh i think you have the opportunity to look at multiple portfolio companies uh, from the background where you come from in that context uh, what's your view on finance function uh, sandeep is it overpaid or is it underpaid <laughs> i think this is one question if you ask anybody in any field they will always feel they are underpaid right, right. Uh, or or they will always feel that they are generally paid less compared to xyz in abc right. department right. uh uh i think um, uh, uh most people have this notion that underpayment means that they're getting less paid less than they feel they're worth i think in in my my view uh, in reality our you know it's the market that decides uh, what someone deserves to be paid and you know market can be influenced by many variables such as the sector of the business that you're in number years of experience in the profession that you have the culture in the organization and so on and so forth so clearly when i look at and i when i look at my own career and i've looked at advice that i've given to folks who are in my team or people that i'm mentoring uh i i always held on to something very dearly whether you are undervalued at work or you're not i think that's the frame that i look at at folks and 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 at what you're doing um you know salary aside i think there are other factors which you should consider which are deal breakers or makers uh I, you know long back when i was part of the operating world not at sequoia but earlier you know we did this survey a uh, talent survey and we found that you know most of the um, job seekers were more, were drawn out for work for things like work environment um, you know uh, what kind of challenge are you giving them what kind of learning opportunity are you providing them so compensation clearly didn't seem like the biggest driver for folks to you know uh, look out for a job or look out for a change i think those are the other aspects uh, and and i quite honestly i think uh, getting paid is a function of the value that you uh, you know that you get you deliver on the table i think right. so it's contextual um, i would not say that whether finance function is under but i've seen finance folks getting very handsome salaries when you compare them with some of the other folks in the organization so it's i think about what you bring on the table i think that's what counts rather than where you come from excellent excellent and uh, what's your all time favorite book sandeep all time favorite i <laughs> you know uh, quite honestly i think uh, uh, i think the one good thing i would say that has happened out of covid is that i got back to some some habit and some rhythm of of going and reading books uh, you know uh, given you know my role at sequoia i was generally on the plane and and the plane meant either i was catching up on sleep or catching up on on emails so there was there was one thing that i was really missing is you know is going back to reading so i think the last uh, uh, for five months i wouldn't say six months because since the time covid happened and all of us were fretting as to what will happen and you know which all companies will survive and which will not so but the last quarter has been a little bit more easy uh, and uh, i have i've actually have three books on the stand right now uh, and one of them that i've completely and i've read it twice is this book called range by david epstein uh, you know and the book talks about how you know in today's world generalists uh, help winning um, and i and i and i think this is a it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's an amazing book i think it's 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 especially relevant for folks who are either a parent or a coach or a leader uh and and clearly you know the few messages that at least resonate very very 
you know clearly with me and i think there and i something that i would like to carry with me as i as i move forward i think this one adage that we always use and we've always heard as we were growing up uh, is like winners never quit and quitters never win i think yeah. the book just dismisses dismisses that uh, and you know it tells you as to when you should you know move on uh, from things that you're pursuing and you know many examples in that book from sportsmen to artists to to scientists uh, you know that come out and have and and then they help you understand that you know people right. didn't start on the path that they chosen to be and mm-hmm. where they are uh, you know clearly one example is van gogh you know i don't know if, if people know but van gogh uh, you know started painting when he was 30 and he didn't know about painting uh, till about 28 29 he went to abc of drawing at the age of 25 or 26 and he was thrown out of that class because he couldn't paint um you know so so i think that's one definitely one book that you know i would i would say that people should 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 read uh, it's an amazing that's book it's a great myth buster so let me now take the opportunity to move to harsh uh, welcome harsh uh, what is the one web series that you have been watching during this lockdown and uh, what is that you would recommend to all of us i think uh, haven't been a big fan of series in the past but lockdown has has kind of given time and no option for entertainment to some extent to get hooked on to that so i did caught a catch up on something uh, old so something called uh, modern family i think okay. i started a decade late uh, but a uh, really interesting one and long one but yeah that that's the one i've been binging on and uh, yeah right uh you have one of been uh, one of those persons who have made a fabulous transition uh moving from a cfo role into a ceo role what is your advice for uh, many of us or many many people who want who are aspiring to move in that side so i think uh, first is cfos uh, and as you mentioned our, uh, the topic itself today as well is are a very in a good position to take over uh, the role of a ceo just because the overall exposure to the business that they are privileged to have right starting from uh, a process uh, exposure via an audit function or a control to the business partnering to capital to different kind of aspects just even remaining within finance domain right. uh, new functions have that uh, exposure to different right. parts of the business so i think they do uh, have the pedigree and experience and exposure to be able to take over the advice would be rather not not necessarily advice is to uh, look for the inner calling and purpose right it's not right. that everyone needs to be a ceo it if at all you are more passionate about business than uh, other functions and more passionate about people driven uh, challenges then i think uh, you would make a good transition from cfo to ceo uh, but there's nothing wrong in just being passionate about tax as well and you know be the t- best person in tax that you want to be so i think it's not a necessary transition but if the inner calling is towards uh, business towards people management i think uh, if if C- cfos or early finance professionals do take exposure to different parts of the business learn about business more than the other finance professionals would want to do and learn about people management so i think these three things that one can do uh I, i'm sure that would be a transition would be far easier and and i would say it's not an easy transition every time i'm still in right. so fair point Arsh. i think it's about pursuing your passion now uh we also understand the uh, background where you come from and uh, i'm sure it's an unbiased answer from you uh invit or direct equity what's your advice and why <laughs> that <laughs> that's a yeah i mean tough to give an unbiased answer there but uh, i would just say it's it's not competition it's not either or it's just a question of asset class right you you own a real right. estate uh, people have portfolio in real estate gold equity mutual fund and under other things so i think yeah uh, in which just is one of the asset class which offers a particular risk return to the investing universe right and depending on what is the risk appetite what is the expectation out of the investment and what is the portfolio strategy for your own investment yeah uh, it 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 may or may not fit in into your portfolio but i think uh, uh, the value prop that invits offer is just about uh, a stable yield generating projects for a longer period of time and a moderate growth so i think uh, not every portfolio would have a place for that uh, so it it's i won't say it's either or it's it's just a uh, uh, 
portfolio diversification for investment. Fabulous. Thanks, Ash. I think uh, Native has also ensured that uh, we have a KBC style question. So there's also an audience poll available in one of the questions. So let me take the opportunity to launch that also. Here we go. Uh, which superpower would you like to have? Mind reading, being invisible, flying or time travel? Are we taking bets? Yeah, we should, Sandeep. Actually, yes. <laughs> I'll go with time travel. Okay. I want to change 2020. Oh, yeah, the question yeah. is to the panelists? Okay. No, 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 again. no, no, it's to the uh, uh, audience. It's to the audience. Yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah. All the above would have been a nice option. As always. <laughs> oh, mind reading. Wow. Wow. Excellent. Excellent. Fabulous. So, uh, uh, without uh, taking much of a time, let me get into the business segment of the uh, topic. Uh, I think uh, any conversation today when we have uh, on any function for that matter, not only finance, if we don't touch on digital and data, seems to be incomplete. And uh, Gopal, you started by looking at uh, how important it is to have a traditional finance mindset also, which is pretty bread and butter uh, for finance professionals. But at the same point of time, uh, as a new age businesses that's going in, or for that matter, an established business, which is also trying to be moving towards uh, getting business done digitally, how does a CFO try to balance the time spent between both these things, a traditional finance and uh, digital transformation? Yeah, I think uh, if you really ask me, and while it, you know, it may sound fashionable, that's the truth. I think that the role of traditional finance is, is not, uh, doesn't create hyper value, except that in terms of governance, you know, both listed and non-listed entities, which are well governed, which are, uh, which have got clean books, which are predictable books, have got an additional valuation coming. That's why you have finally managed companies getting that additional valuation. But you know, that is only one part of the story, which means that's health and hygiene. Right. I think from a CFO perspective and from the finance team perspective, what I try to drive with the team is to say that, guys, uh, understand the business a lot more. Uh, go and do things which are not really related to your business. Go to the front end. Go see how a truck and a bus is sold. Uh, go to a state transport undertaking when the negotiations are happening or be part of a vendor negotiation. And right. more importantly, keep visiting the tech center as if that is the, you know, the, the, the fulcrum of uh, any company. Because that's where the whole thing is... Uh, getting done right the right. other thing is to be completely savvy on uh, i think uh, uh, network systems and digital because a lot of what we have been doing and we are doing even as i speak to you can be taken over by a more intelligent uh, systems and processes and controls and technology so right. once you get that digital data coming in you can actually use analytics these are all now almost five years old here five seven years old right. what we're talking right. about and right. then you've got hyper analytics now so a lot of trending can be done and then you start discussing. You see, finally, hmm. the value does not come from reporting what you have done. Right. That is, it's like, I, I keep on telling this, you know, the more and more a function is rear view mirror, like yep. driving in a car, 99.9% .9 of the time you are actually looking at the windshield and looking at the yep. road ahead. And that's right. what the business wants. That's what the community wants. That's what, uh, you know, you need to be focusing yeah. on if you want to stay ahead here. So, right. If we also need to do the same thing. Yes, the occasional look at the rear view mirror is very, very important. Yeah. You know, the side view mirrors also are important to stay right. safe. But you right. also want to reach your destination. So uh, the idea and uh, what we have been doing within the company, and I think there's a long journey ahead, is to convert a lot of data into, uh, you know, getting a lot of data from systems, uh, ensuring that transaction processing, the people, in the, you know, the, the efforts that get into transaction processing are minimized get in high speed channels of approvals, processes, get the transactions through. And then right. after that, use digital to and analytics actually to look at patterns, right? Mm -hmm. And not patterns only for finance related stuff. Right. The right. biggest advantage that all of us have, you know, and all of us can use very strategically for our company is the wealth of data and information that flows through our department. Right. You know, no other department has that. Yeah. So, so it's, it's important for us to see how we are trending as a company, how we are trending as a business, 
uh, what's happening outside, all of this becomes super crucial. So if you really ask me 10, 10 years from now, why 10 years? I would say even five years, three years, four years. You would actually see even the current form of accounting, the current form of bookkeeping, the current form of governance, yeah. tracking, all of this will be taken over by you know, machines. Yeah. Just like even diagnosis is done by doctors today or even uh, you know, legal outcomes are predicted by uh, AI today. So we need to learn uh, AI, we need to learn uh, analytics and we need to formally believe in those systems. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not complex. Uh, it is complex, but it's not complex. But whenever I have this discussion, I only tell two things to whoever says, you know, but you know, a lot of this is not our thing. I'll say, try explaining the game of cricket to an American. Hmm. Okay. And then I say, look at what you do with your mobile. The stuff that you do with your mobile is actually complex. You do a whole bunch of stuff it, with, a, with a handheld. But we learn it like, you know, it, it, our kids, the newborn kids seem to start using it. So we need to get attached to, you know, kind of uh, digital and analytics. And what I call it, personally, I just call it a super tech. If you don't get attached to it, actually, we'll be left far behind in the race. And it's super crucial to make that difference. That's what organizations want from us. Thanks, Kupal. I think very well said. I think uh, if I were to relate to it, while at one point of time you started to say that traditional finance does create an additional value, even on an overall value creation journey. But if you don't move towards the new age, it will be like a fossil fuel. So it's important that us two people balance that out and uh, we get themselves ready to move to the new age. But uh, on that, let, let me let me just clarify one thing. I actually don't I don't say that traditional finance is uh, is creates more value. It doesn't. Mm -hmm. But the absence of it can devalue. So what we need to do as leaders and even as middle management guys, just like Sandeep said, you know, we need to ensure that the new guys who come in are actually going through the rudimentary processes on which the whole thing rests. Fair point. You know, without without understanding that. Ultimately, the value creation happens not because you do your accounting right or you do your right. governance right. This mm -hmm. is like, you know, that's all like brushing your teeth. It's expected that organizations will drive that. Right. But that will not create value. But absence of it can create devalue. So as leaders, right. if you ask me, we right. need to spend some portion of our time very efficiently on these aspects. You know, that's what investors are looking like, saying that the numbers that I read are the numbers that are real. And right. I want to invest or disinvest on that basis. But Pure governance and accounting and, you know, all of that cannot create value by itself. Well that, that is not what I meant, actually. That's the foundation that you lay and then you build on it to the next level. And if you don't get it, absolutely. It'll, absolutely. It'll actually, absolutely. It'll erode the value. Absolutely right. Yeah. It's so, like a foundation. It cannot be seen. Yeah. Yeah. And as we move on uh, that note, Dinesh, probably... At the same point of time, what we have been seeing is that when we talk about digital and data, uh, there are jargons that we hear about a big data or a data lake being created. Sometimes we tend to boil the ocean also. Where do you think the right balance is uh, between uh, these two? And when we get into data, where do you draw the line? When do you get into digital, where do you draw the line? Yeah, I think, it's, I think it's a very pertinent question because clearly it is a very contemporary subject, very topical. And I'd, uh, I'd imagine for CFOs like ourselves and indeed all of those out there, irrespective of the organization, uh, digital and data, data would clearly be one of the foremost priorities, right? And uh, right. it's as much about uh, navigating and demystifying uh, right. what is there on offer because yeah. there are cases where you don't know what you don't know, but you know that there is something out there which is evolving, which can potentially unlock value for your business. Yeah. Uh, I, th I think as a CFO, I'm a strong believer that, you know, when I look at uh, the four uh, dimensions of where finance uh, uh, plays a very significant role within the business, whether it is protecting value, unlocking value, generating value, or communicating value, the four dimensions of value, the way I put it together, I think uh, digital data and data has uh, a very important role to play. But I think as an organization, as a function, and as leaders, uh, whilst we evangelize the, the tech adoption, uh, and the benefits that tech can bring, I think it's very important for us to be clear also as to what are we seeking out uh, to deliver, right? Because it's a minefield out there. Uh, you can get lost uh, and it can go on endlessly. So I think it's very important to define uh, what is that tech roadmap? What is the tech journey? And I also say this because different organizations, processes, business models are at various stages of evolution, right? And depending on the state of maturity, uh, you need to really pick 
uh, of what would your immediate priority be? And you know, just take for example, at very at one end of the spectrum of of digital and data is very uh, let me call mainstream, very plain vanilla automation. You know, people doing stuff manually, doing it on worksheets, need to be integrated with system with legacy systems, enterprise systems. That's one very basic piece. Uh, a big priority though, because uh, I've known it to really uh, liberate a lot of energy and, and in, in many ways really release a lot of trapped capacity, right? And it just helps uh, to have a leader be able to facilitate that. That's one end. And I think then as you move forward, whether it is data visualization, you know, the whole uh, move from an industry which was looking at raw data and to processing it into meaningful MIS, uh, probably the next piece. And then you go into integrating it, you go into APIs, you go into RPA for repetitive processes. And then finally you move to the most evolved stage at some point of time. And I'm guessing, you know, as we push out our thinking, there will be a further horizon, but probably the most evolved stages where uh, you're using all of this for predictive, right? And you've integrated it in, into your business. Uh, right. And I think that's a journey and you need to really be able to assess where is your organization, where's your function. Right. Uh, really in that roadmap. And my experience has told me that the quick wins come in uh, when you start to leverage uh, digital and tech fundamentally for transactions, transaction processing, low hanging fruit, get it out of the way, fairly proven, enough use cases out there, uh, gives you early wins, builds confidence in the team. Because remember, it is a fairly significant change management mm -hmm. effort, right? So before you talk about boiling the ocean, it's also mm -hmm. about people feeling energized in that process and seeing the light of the day and seeing uh, some productive outcomes. And therefore, to me, right. transaction processing has enough used uh, cases out there, enough expertise out there for you to be able to really get some early wins going and building some impetus around that program. Right. Then you probably move to functional effectiveness, where again, uh, you know, as Gopal mentioned, in the case of finance, uh, you can evangelize it. We, we have access to a host of data and, you know, it's a question of how uh, you're able to utilize that and put it to use. Right. And I think then you move to the final horizon, which is about how do you use tech data digital to really be able to unlock business efficiency. Right. right. So those are three horizons the way I see it. But I think as you do this, and you talk about boiling the ocean. Uh, mm -hmm. I think there will be one very clear skill that will emerge. Right. right. And when I just look at it over a period of time, and I think talent will have a very, very important role to play in this. Yeah. And, and the reason I'm steering away from boiling the ocean is because that clearly is a function of perception. It's a function of what people are doing and what they're seeing as an outcome of it. Right. But from a talent perspective, I see a significant shift in this area and I'm already starting to see it. And I'm realizing that the workforce of the future for a finance function can actually have people who are very differently wired. Right. right. So there was this whole industry that flourished and, you know, uh, people skilled themselves uh, and told you they moved from really being able to process data into meaningful information. There was a whole MIS industry that came came about that way. And today, I think a lot of people take pride in MIS. But I think when you're talking about big data, you're talking about the number of data points, talking about integrating data from multiple sources, uh, systems, uh, and various other uh, channels. Uh, yeah. I think the fundamental, uh, uh, a fundamental skill that will emerge is really how do you process it? How do you move from meaningful information to actionable insight? Right. I see that skill today in short supply. Fair. It's a skill which has to be honed, mm. right? Mm. Uh, I'm fine, and I think all of us who really have uh, bandwidth challenges with businesses growing, expanding, right? I think yeah. you clearly need that skill to emerge, which is fundamentally the ability of people to really make sense out of this vast amount of, let's not call it meaningful data, but information and process it in and distill it out into actionable insight, okay. right? Yeah. When you have some of these that start to come in, I think we will move away from the commentary of saying, are we boiling the ocean? Because to my mind, I think it's a bit premature to say we're boiling the ocean. I think a lot of the organizations are still in that discovery phase mm -hmm. and they will have to go through that moment of discovery before they call out saying, is it really worth pursuing or not? And I think there is enough uh, of that journey that some organizations are made and some are on to uh, before they really call out uh, boiling the ocean. So I think it's a journey. I think it has to be a foremost priority because it is a big enabler to business uh, and it's a big enabler to a business that is scaling uh, and rapidly expanding. The only way to do it efficiently in the future will be through leveraging data digital uh, for competitive advantage. Yeah. And therefore, I'm not in the space of saying I'll be boiling the ocean right now. Some of that could be very transactional. Right. Uh, in my experience, boiling the ocean, for example, mm -hmm. uh, one very basic piece. And this is, uh, this is uh, something which, uh, which I've been through. It's a journey that we've been through ourselves. And I think it's, it's hard to let go. But I think a disproportionate amount of time spent on financial forecasting 
right uh, which is quite lopsided yep and not as much time spending on analysis of the real results yeah because inherent in the belief is if you if you shape the forecast really accurately which by itself is a bit of an oxymoron mm. you think that what gets delivered is pretty much in line and i have known that a lot of time is really then spent on the forecasting piece as opposed to the analysis of the real that to me is an instance of boiling the ocean and that is something therefore that i would steer away from uh, as as a practice i think a uh, very well uh, laid out thoughts dinesh i think uh, one of the thing that i really took it out from this is probably i think the journey on this entire data started or digital started somewhere we started providing data as an mis function it moved into something called as an information as an fp and a function maybe at this point of time it's about getting insights through a function that is more about business intelligence which is bi or business insights fair yeah uh, on that note uh, harsh uh as we talk about this subject it's also about uh, doing a lot of crystal ball gazing to the future i think uh, somewhere if i have to take a segue from what uh, dinesh said it's about uh, not about spending too much of time on uh, forecasting but it's to, to know that as to what has happened in your actuals and therefore the outcome is a forecast but when you do this crystal ball gazing for the future uh, how do you go about it and at the same point of time there is always a question of when it comes to digital and digital uh, investments is it a cost or really an investment how, how do you approach it so i would take that to both these things as different uh, questions i would say well they are linked at some point but uh, right. fundamentally principally they are different uh, yeah. perspectives first with respect to forecasting i think dinesh addressed that perfectly well yeah. right uh, it's it's rather a goal seek that goes in that what should be the forecast then what would be the forecast right absolutely planning exercises i think and if one was to really plan what would be that can only come from probably analysis of the past and what you see today instead of what it should be so i think that should be uh, forecasting is is really crystal ball gazing but uh, besides that if one really does the analysis of past as well as potential scenarios that may pan out in future dispassionately i think that's something which is useful for business for overall planning but uh, it, it it it's not the core part i would say of the overall planning process i think that's how i would put it right in terms of investment versus uh, i would say uh, if question was whether it's an investment or a cost cost yeah i, I think uh, i think it, it it's up to how you utilize that right and as again going back to what dinesh mentioned in terms of do you have talent which is going to be making use of this cost and converting that into investment right so just by saying that every investment in digital is going to be investment or it is going to be a cost may not be right but does does, does your company have an ecosystem where this digital investment is going to be utilized to the best of it and uh, towards uh, enhancing your business and overall strategy so i think that is the key to me to differentiate between the two and uh, different companies would be at a different point in time in their uh, digital journey yeah but i think the realization of where you are in your journey before making that decision is very critical because that is what going to result in whether you spend the money and that became a cost or it yeah. became an investment so i think where in your digital journey you are your realization of that position and then investment into the right level of digitization so okay. these three things would define whether whether it ends up becoming a investment or a cost thanks thanks harsh so uh, we have heard from gopal dinesh and harsh in terms of from their respective uh, industries and background how does digital transformation go in and sadeep from your perspective where you have seen this uh, in terms of a journey uh, and a road map in multiple organizations that you have in the portfolio how does this impact operation business uh, and the people metrics uh, for the portfolio companies that you have seen you are on mute so apologies so i think one one short answer to you know this is that you know uh, digital tech transformation if adopt if adopted and implemented the right way i think impacts all of these favorably uh, and i think both the nation has kind of related to the fact that you know how you know it's not just about embracing the the newer you know uh, term of of a transformation uh, seamlessly and mindlessly 
without thinking about where you are you know in in the journey uh, yeah. you know and and we see this through our portfolio right because we have companies in all stages they are very young companies who are trying to establish their product market fit and i think there is no point of of talking of digital transformation to those companies uh, you know get the product right have a go to market and then think about transformation uh, because you know you can only transform if you have something uh, not before that yeah. uh, and then there is this this you know this middle layer which is which is kind of achieved both a product market fit and a gtm is now trying to break out i think there what we do is we start with a little bit of a more basic kind of an approach saying that we're not going to change the entire house we're going to start with the the basic bedrock of the organization which is like you know embedding a for us actually the challenges are very different because most of the organizations that we invest in you know they operate on excel i mean the semblance of systems and technologies is very limited to begin with and therefore our push is to adopt technology at the bottom right. uh, uh you know which is less as you move from a tally or an excel to an a uh, credible light touch erp right that's yep. what our step 1 is and then the step 2 is uh, getting your core systems integrated with your accounting systems embedding a organization wide culture of of systems processes technology so i think it's a journey as far as the startup ecosystem is concerned but but i mean having worked in 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 seemingly larger organizations before my role at sequoia i think we've we've seen this play out play out uh, very well uh, it's a journey you don't get instant results so one has to you know be you has to be persistent has to persevere uh, and has to kind of give it the time to seed into a large organization because otherwise you know the the results could be quite counterproductive therefore to me i think across all the three areas which you know you mentioned kali was around operations i think you know you improve efficiency you enhance customer experience um you know in generally people metrics i think you the adoption of technology helps you move away the mundane jobs hopefully you have better attritions or lower attritions you um, you know inculcate a, a culture of creativity and ingenuity in the business fostering an environment of constant innovation i think so so from that standpoint i mean like you know if you look at the theme per se yes it does but i think it's very important to you know carefully analyze and assess as to where you are in the journey you know it's not about mindless adoption and and carrying the 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 framework from what other people are doing i think that's the key for, for as far as i look at it excellent i think uh, uh, if i have to summarize in a nutshell what i heard from all of you is that there is a thumping yes towards digital transformation but what is equally important to understand is that know where you are and what's your starting point and it's going to be a journey that's going to happen over a period of time and do what is right for your organization and not something fancy just because something is happening in the outside world and eventually all these things should try to get us insights than uh, throwing up tons of data or information fabulous so uh, on that note probably i think uh, as we spent a lot of time around digital and digital transformation let me also move into the next segment which is talking about a little bit of softer skills a little bit of how do you look at internal and external perspective and brand building and change management uh let me start with uh, uh, dinesh dinesh you have uh, gone through a journey uh, you have moved from an uh, mnc organization where you have been for a pretty long tenure and now you have shown the agility to come into an uh, indian organization and doing it uh, doing a great job and in that perspective uh, overall what are the three things that help you to reach where you are today sure so uh, you know let me reflect back on my journey and i think uh, a few of the things which have stood me in good stead over the years uh, i think uh, the first is clearly what i call the the diversity of experience so i was fortunate to be a part of a system which actively encouraged it uh, you know and uh, very early in in my career i had formed a point of view saying uh, you know i i didn't want to be a specialist uh, much as uh, uh, that could have been a route at that point of time uh but i but i chose clearly i think uh, working with the business always excited me uh, also early immersion into my career started with business and therefore it just helped solidify that view uh yeah. and then as i went along uh, you know uh, had a breadth of experience spanning both uh, let me call it corporate finance and business finance roles and i think that's given me uh, what i consider to be a very valuable but a very rich 
experience of running a business. So whether it was working uh, with marketing teams, whether it was working with supply chain, sales and customer development, uh, uh, pretty much uh, across all running joint ventures. So I think the breadth of experience, I think if you if you aspire to be a CFO someday, uh, uh, to my mind, I think it's, it's a great idea to really build your repertoire of experiences uh, across uh, both dimensions of the function as well as the business. And I think uh, the system and the ecosystem enabled me to do that. And uh, I, I then kind of picked, went from one to the other. So today, uh, you know, I'm not the specialist, but I, I know how various areas connect with the business. I know who the go-to people are and through this perspective, I'm able to connect where the function can add value to the business. Uh, yeah. and work in close harmony. So to me, the breadth of experiences, the diversity of experiences across a range of dimensions just helped uh, build me out into, into what uh, uh, I aspired to be, which was a CFO, right? I think the second thing which worked uh, really well, and again, this was facilitated by the system, and I think uh, there is uh, an increasing conversation these days which happens on uh, this whole new dimension on agility quotient, right? Which essentially is saying that, uh, uh, you know, are you growing adaptability or are you adaptable along the way? You know, so you move from EQ, IQ, and then there's this whole uh, agility piece which is now coming into these. Uh, fortunately, it was an ecosystem which uh, which allowed us to move uh, every three, two or three years into new jobs. Uh, and that therefore pushed me out of a comfort zone. Now, just imagine this. You start a job which is wholly into uncharted territory. You master it. Three years hence, when you're at the peak performance on the top of your job, you're really landing significant output, very productive, enjoying it thoroughly. Yeah. Uh, you're all set to be moved to another job thrown into uncharted territory, right? You start afresh, you know, how does your graph move? You have the peak performance and then you exit, you start all the way again. And I think uh, inherent in that process over the many years, over the, the number of jobs that I have done through my career, uh, I realized the one thing that was happening was adaptation, mm -hmm. the ability to learn, unlearn and relearn, yeah. right? And step out of my comfort zone. So today I think, uh, uh, that is something I actively try and tell a lot of people, it's, which is saying, seek out new experiences. We don't know, uh, you know, the subconscious benefits that it would bring in really completing your personality. And to me, I think that stood in good stead. I don't want to sound prescriptive, but this is a personal reflection of what I think uh, has, has really shaped me into who I am. And I think the third is, is a bit philosophical, but, uh, you know, uh, sometimes I see it missing with people. And, you know, it, it goes back to a very basic question that you ask people saying, you know, what would you like to do? And I, uh, an oft uh, answer that I get is people saying, you know, just give me a good, exciting job. And right. I would tell a lot of people, you know, form a point of view about what you want to do. Mm -hmm. Take input, seek mentoring, get coaching, right? Uh, seek out, but eventually form a very definite point of view of what you want to do and then take charge of your career because then that allows you to layer on experiences, right? Right. 12, 13 years into my career, I realized a lot of my experiences were over-indexed on business finance and I needed core finance experience if I wanted to become the CFO someday, right? In my mind, that was taking charge of my career. And then after that, there were definitive interventions on saying what I will do to be able to bridge that gap. And so therefore, that's the one thing I tell people that take charge of your career because then it allows you to pace yourself out to a very important point that, that Sandeep mentioned. Don't allow someone else to determine your pace, right? So take charge of your career, right? Pace yourself out and then determine where those gaps are and then find the reason to be able or the means to be able to fill those gaps, whether it is through experiences, whether it is through roles, whether it is through projects, whether it's through interactions. Because then I think you're really in many ways taking charge of yourself and the outcome that you finally get to. So I think these are really three, uh, it sounds a bit prescriptive, but when I reflect back on my journey, I think these are things which, which has stood me in good stead. And of course you need an enabling ecosystem to be able to facilitate, encourage, uh, encourage uh, you along this way. Yeah? And I think as yeah. leaders, Having been through that process, uh, clearly that is what we then owe to our talent for them to really flourish, which is really to provide them with this kind of an ecosystem and an enabling system uh, right. for them to really find their true calling. Just a related question to that, Dinesh. I think uh, hmm. very well said in terms of how you see these three things panning out. But at the same point of time, career is also a journey, which has got multiple experiences coming in. And some point okay. of time, the, the new age people coming in and say, hey, I've spent two years in the role, I'm ready for the next role. So how yeah. do you balance that width and depth, which leads to an expertise in the role and it's not about time spent in the role? 
Yeah, I think, you know, I think over a period of time, organizations that have moved to a model of rotating people and talent over a period of time have realized that, you know, if anyone told you he wants to move in six months to a year, yeah, I think it is hugely premature because it takes you six months to really get into the grain of a job, right? right. Uh, the next six months, you start to contribute actively. Right. Yeah, and in the subsequent years, you then start to really deliver meaningful impact and heighten your contribution. Right. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, a lot of people who I've noticed who come and want to rush is because they're wanting to race, right? It's the sprint. It's this peer pressure. Mm -hmm. It is, he has moved. My batchmate has moved, Mm -hmm. right? Why can't I? And I think that's one of the things, peer pressure, you know, and this whole piece can almost end up trying to accelerate a journey, which at the end of the day, you know, it really doesn't matter. You're running your race. And if you want to get to the CFO, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I was telling myself, you know, whether I become a CFO at 40 or I become a CFO at 43, I still have enough enough runway yeah. to be able to land the impact that I want to. I don't have to race into it, but it's important to get those experiences along the way. Right. And I think it goes back into a lot of people being mentored saying, you know what, it's not this race. Yeah. Two years, three years, good time to spend the job, all right? Even yeah. longer, organization benefits, you benefit, but anything earlier than that, I think uh, it's it's not in the normal. It's not the most optimal. Very very well. But I think uh, because I also also think from an organization perspective, you know, let's let's face it from both ways. Uh, an individual wants to seek that experience, mm. wants to move on, gain multiple experiences. Great, mm. you know, that answers the question in terms of what's in it for the individual. Mm. But there's an organization dimension as well. The organization which is investing in you, mm. right, needs to also benefit. Yeah. From your upskilling, from the fresh perspective. Yeah. Yeah. And you've got to give that some runway. So I then therefore think prematurely moving and jumping jobs, not the most optimal, neither for the individual, because he doesn't know what he's missing out on. Yeah. And whilst he's contributing, it clearly is a part of development for him, but equally right. for the organization as well. Excellent. Excellent. Very well said. I, 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 Kali, sorry, just to add to what Dinesh said, I think it's so important for people to understand this that, you know, making that that time assessment of, 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 and then deciding where you are in your job is, 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 is wrong because, you know, the organization also hasn't seen and felt the impact that you have left uh, or have created when you're doing that role. And there will, there will never be advocators of your brand. And, yeah. you know, it, therefore it's very important for folks to, you know, realize that, that it's today, it's, it's, it's not a hundred meter race that you can do and come out and say, okay, wow, I've impressed everybody. This is the long it's a long term race. It's 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 That's maybe it. a marathon, and you need to stay the course. Brilliant, brilliant. Yes, I think it's very well said. You know, Kalis, one more piece. I think uh, you know, I would tell a lot of people who are starting careers, saying in the initial period of your career, right, for the right, first few right. years, right, leave it, leave it to a set of people, leave it to your line managers, leave it to functional right. resource committees, leave it to all right. the people who are making career decisions right. to make some of these decisions because they've been there, done that, and there's years yeah. of experience to back them up when they know what they, they've been through this journey. Right. As you grow through and mm-hmm. you start to form a more discernible view of, of your career, your development, your needs, and how you want to build yourself and pace yourself out, yeah. that's when you take full charge of it. But in the initial period, just go with the flow. Let, mm-hmm. let the system and let a few mm-hmm. people who've been there, done that, really mm-hmm. decided for you. Have the trust and faith in the ecosystem to ensure that they are here to make you successful. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah, that's it. So actually, as much as we talk about uh, how careers have been successful and how people have fast-paced their careers or run a marathon uh, in line with what an organization moves in. Uh, maybe Gopal, you bring in a lot of expertise from various organizations and the wealth of uh, years of experience that you bring on the table. As much as we talk about success uh, in this journey, we would have all gone through failures. Uh, how did you handle that? And what are some of the lessons that you would like to share with us? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I, I would possibly just continue where I think Dinesh and Sandeep had so aptly kind of commented on the topic or shared their views. I think the whole thing is to ensure that uh, you don't view yourself as the center of everything. Yeah. The moment you view that, you know, then you start putting yourself in first and then you start putting your function in first. And then after that, all the other decisions are taken based on that view, which is, I believe, is not either good for the individual, nor good for the, uh, you know, for the organization. Excellent. So what happens is one of the, the most important things is to place yourself on the other person in the other person's shoes mm-hmm. and then see what is the perspective that he or she are trying to bring to the table. 
right and then when you try to actually use your experience or your functional skill mm -hmm. uh, or your own perspective to overlay that that becomes true collaboration because then the guy knows yeah i want to make a sale right. this guy is trying to help me make a sale but he's trying to make me help uh, help me make an efficient sale right right so it becomes very easy, it becomes easy for the decisions and discussions to go on and yeah. especially so when you is uh, you know when you're wearing the finance hat because right. like the topic says we are all viewed as gatekeepers mm. but we don't understand that gatekeepers are not people who close gates mm. gatekeepers can be people who open gates well said yeah. right and people can open gates yeah. in various forms they can in certain cases you can open the gate fully in certain cases you let one at a time all of that is good for the for, for whether it's a cinema queue or whether it is a queue for funds it doesn't matter right, right? so this is one part the the second part is yes i have had my uh, more than my share of failures some of them seem very disastrous about 15 years 20 years ago uh, when i actually realized that in one of my jobs and that was actually now when i look at it i said it's not material but it was where i actually missed out 100 crores in a cross block of a of a business right. and i had not calculated depreciation this was way 1994 95 when i was like sweating like crazy right. like sweating like crazy and i i had to go in but i have always found one thing here hmm. the best way to tackle a mistake if it's suppose it's your own hmm. or your teams hmm. is to kind of first internalize it and mentally own it up the right. moment you do that you get peace okay and the second one is to go with your head held high and say actually i kind of bossed it up big time and i am trying to take some corrective steps but these are the things that we are doing uh goes and resonates well with people instead of saying you know that guy didn't give it this guy didn't give it i didn't get it in time etc etc all of which is 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 totally you know is nobody's problem yeah the that's very important the third second part is at an organization level if there are some strategic calls which have gone wrong right we must remember that when we have given assent to it as a member of the team we are as in, you know as responsible for the decision as anybody else yep we cannot say you know i'm giving this decision but subject to this 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 which yep. is like it it doesn't help it, yep. finally what happens is the decision is whether you're saying a yes or a no and right. if you say no it is a no if if these things are not taken care of fine no problem at all but otherwise it's a team it's a team decision it's a cross functional decision sometimes decisions will go wrong we need to fail fast rise up move on in life and that is a communication that you also have to give to your teams because what happens is unfortunately i am also talking from a function perspective look at it from the functions perspective all of the organization that all that the organization does right you know, buy sell recruit spend Mm -hmm. all of that actually converges into finance in one way or the other but after the event is almost over after the commitment is made right. after the right. deals are clicked and then mm -hmm. what happens is when you start actually responding to that situation it becomes a little too late it's like rear view mirror driving right. so what right. i told these guys is it's like you know it's like playing tennis uh, go to the nets and play mm -hmm. don't do baseline playing because it doesn't help right the game right. is uninteresting you keep lobbing the ball slow yeah effective, right it doesn't help so i said go and reach out for that ball before it even hits you because you you are aware the second one is take clued in don't get worried that you are not been called for this meeting so it's not my problem it will come to you yeah it will come to you in one form or the other so many times it's it's quite good to be open and this is, see these are the ways you actually start avoiding mistakes also right you can actually go right. tell your superior excuse me but whichever who whoever is the superior whether it is the ceo or whether it is a cfo or whether it is a cxo or whether it is somebody else below general manager hey i believe that i should have been called for this meeting i believe this meeting was held right. why don't you call me from the next time because i can add value there and i can give you the perspective there on right so that's the other way but coming to your core question mistakes will happen but our job is also to ensure that we minimize them as much as possible and we can't make a career out of making mistakes and admitting them so yeah. it's important yeah. that you know we do a lot of you know we, we we predict a lot of outcomes you know so for example you you let us look at the current covid situation right uh, what what could i have done as uh, as 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 one of the leadership team members the first right. thing i did and that's right. nothing great i'm sure each of the panelists and each of the finance team members outside who listening to you would done it on yeah. third week of march i said something is going horribly wrong 
and mm-hmm. I have to expect that things will go horribly wrong for the next six months. Right. right. So the first thing to do was to say, guys, I think this can happen, but I'm not being pessimistic. I'm a finance guy, but I'm a nice guy. Mm-hmm. I smile. I enjoy a joke, but I think there could be a problem. So let's look at what it looks like if the volumes evaporate for the first quarter and it goes limping for the second quarter. What happens? Right. So when right. You, and you turn it around. You don't get into too much of detailing. You do some good, you know, good, uh, you know, approximations. And then the, the the most important decision we took is leave out everything now. The first thing we do is safety. Have daily safety calls. That didn't come out of the presentation, but that came out. That came out because we said no safety of people is the most important thing. The second one is liquidity. I said. Cash is oxygen now. We need to breathe for the next six, seven months. Yeah. So we will borrow. We may over borrow. We may have a negative carry, but it's worth the cost. Yeah. The third thing was to look at what we do on expenditure because we obviously knew revenues are coming off, right? right? They're coming off quite significantly. So how do we make our company more resilient? How do we take accountability for a lot of families that depend on decisions that are taken by a few individuals at the top? Yeah. Now, when you give those perspectives, it actually was pretty well received. People said, "Hey, this was really useful because I was fuddy all over in my head. What is going to happen? This has given me, given me the option either to agree with your, uh, you know, forecast or at least disagree with your forecast. You know, one of the most important things in decision making is when you draw a line, you know, either you are reasonably on mark or you are off mark. Both are good decisions. Right. Both are good decisions. And right. if suppose we hadn't done it, and let's assume that. We did it slowly in the month of June, July. That would have been a mistake. Fair. No, that would have been a mistake, right. uh, uh, which I'm sure that none of us will actually forgive ourselves for. Yeah. I think ultimately the team, the other thing I'll tell you, you are, if you look at it from a finance perspective, and I'm sorry I talk like a philosopher sometimes, but um, no, 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 no. you are in the finance side. If I just look at purely finance, let's leave out non-finance. You are nothing but the aggregation of all the good work that the team does, you possibly go to the podium to collect the awards, or you can also be the aggregate of all the weaknesses that your team has, right? Or all the fears that your team has, which right. it doesn't come and tell you. So the best thing to do is to not only create a culture of accountability, which is important, yeah. but at the same time ensure that your team members feel free to come and discuss if they have any problems, right? You know, then what happens is I found that that's another way of averting issues. Yeah. You know, that's another way of averting issues. So mm-hmm. you can actually then become a kind of a sigma of mm-hmm. the strength of your team and ensure that you're minimizing the sigma of the, 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 the negative aspects of your team. And then after that, provide the air cover that your team requires to actually deal with the senior leadership team or external people who are at a senior level. Many of them have fears, you know, at a manager level. A guy will think, how do I, you know, how do I approach this topic with a general manager or a vice president? Yeah. You know, at that point in time, it becomes important to say, okay, you go and swim. I won't let you sink. But if I find that you're bobbing in and out of the water after three, four trials, then I'll come and pick you. Don't worry. Give them that experience of interaction, but also trying to pick them up when they need to be saved. And I think that there are multiple ways to look at this. But at the end of it, I'll tell you, it's, it's, we are all human beings. And, you know, we, we need to be warm. And we yeah. need to be practical and we need yeah. to actually disassociate, disassociate ourselves from what I call this, you know, the CFO or the CEO or the CTO or anything. We are just, these are all for me just names. Yeah. What matters is we actually have a responsibility to discharge. For example, if I take my own company, whatever decisions that I take, which are purely within my, within my um, ambit, can impact 40 to 50,000 people. Mm. Mm. So that weighs pretty heavily on the shoulders. So when, whenever we, whenever I think about it, I say, hey, is this, is this the right thing that you would do for yourself? If it is, okay, go ahead and do it. That's how I view life. Fair enough. I think well said, Gopal. Mm-hmm. I think uh, how do you balance decision making, right decision making, timing of it, and also it's okay to be vulnerable. Eventually, end of the day, we are all human beings. But it's important that you own it up and also create a culture in the organization where people come to you even if there is an issue. And therefore, they have that uh, opportunity to take risk in a guarded manner and get it into success mode. Well said, Gopal. On that note, probably, Sandeep, uh, again, I'm just drawing a lot of inference on the portfolio experience that you bring on the table. Uh, it's always a tough call to look at to say that as to, hey, as much as we talk about what brings, uh, what makes a great CFO and how much of business partnering that we need to do, a balance of traditional versus uh, modern age requirement. 
Uh, how do you see that as to how do you uh, see people drawing line between uh, being controller centric and consumer centric? Uh, uh, many a times you would need to balance both and it is important to do that. I think uh, when Gopal said, uh, it's gatekeeper is not about closing the gate, it's also opening the gate in the right manner. It could be in a faced manner. So in that sense, uh, do you see a urging need for people to be largely consumer focused CFOs or customer focused CFOs as compared to the uh, someone who's being uh, control oriented or uh, uh, finance control oriented uh, mode? I think, uh, you know, you, you can never be either. Uh, you know, that's, uh, that's the way I think about it. Right. I mean, as a CFO, how can you not have controls and, and let the, you know, right. you know, water flow through the gates? I okay. mean, you know, that's core. I mean, that's basic, right? So, yeah. so you can't, can't have a situation where a CFO is not on top of his balance sheet. He's not on top of his tax positions. Yeah. He's not on top of, you know, how many days is his cash cycle taking to convert? I, I think these are basics and you need to be on top of it. Yeah. I think what's important is for you to be consumer focused and, you know, um, uh, and, and, and be seen as somebody who's approachable is the need to relentlessly, I think, communicate or maybe over communicate with your customers and tell them and educate them and help them understand as to why this is important. And if this does not happen, what it leads to, because, you know, often it becomes a little territorial, right? I'm that I am finance and I know this and you don't know this. I think the important job for a CF or a controller or a head of finance is to bridge that gap mm -hmm. of, 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 of laying out to people and understanding as to what the challenges are. I think Gopal mentioned at very early on that how important it is to go out for finance folks to go and speak with the customer, understand what their challenges are, understand what their pains are. You know, because if you don't get a perspective on the other side, you can never be empathetic. You can never provide a solution to your, your sales sales guy, your customer service team, or your operations person. I think and that's something that very early on I learned in my career that if you don't get a perspective the other side, you can be sitting in your ivory tower and doing a lot of things which could be counterintuitive to business. And therefore, it's important to connect the dots, you know, stay connected in this, in this hyper, you know, world uh, and, and do engage and communicate more. I think to me, Personally, if you ask me, I think that's the only message that I would say that, you know, you can't choose to be one. You have, unfortunately or fortunately, we have to play that balancing role of making sure controls are intact. And at the same point of you're seeing as somebody who's fostering growth, who's driving excellence, who's pushing the business forward by looking at the right things. Uh, and therefore, uh, you know, to me, it's not about either or. I think you will have to have to find the right balance. Right. That balance will not come from day one. I mean, like it's a journey. You mm -hmm. can't expect on day one when you land on a CFO seat and you will say, okay, now I think I'll get 50-50. No, it doesn't happen like that. You know, you'll begin yeah. from 70 and you probably go to a 50. Right. Uh, so yeah, so that's, that's, that's probably my quick take on this one. Thanks, Sandeep. And actually putting all this together, we talked about uh, uh, an importance of EQ, IQ and AQ that Dinesh talked about or in terms of how do you balance between a uh, a uh, gatekeeper and a business partner, or even being a strategist as a finance function. Harsh, when it comes to talent hiring within your team, how do you approach with these aspects in mind? And uh, what are the things that you look at uh, for either a new hire or your own team member? Yeah. So I think the most important part is uh, about a culture fit. And I think what a lot Gopal uh, spoke about just some minutes back is to do with the culture that what culture do you have in the organization in your function and is the person who is hiring is the right culture fit and i would say culture would play at least at a senior level more than 50 60 percent of the decision that right. uh, are, you, are you recruiting the right person and and uh, is he going to fit in the system is he going to continue with the culture to foster talent foster people and business or it it it, it can really go the other way around so i think culture is the first thing that uh, we look for uh, when when recruiting senior team members. Uh, second, again, uh, will be other software aspects beyond culture with respect to, I would say, potential. That is the person joining with uh, a focus on potential of achieving something bigger than what has been achieved already, or it is uh, it is an ar having arrived seat that you know I've arrived and I'm kind of entitled for this position. So I think. Uh, that's the other thing which is important for at least our business and believe elsewhere as well, that uh, it is important for people to have that potential gap to ensure that they grow both personally 
professionally, functionally, and have that aspiration to grow. Uh, so I think that's the second point. So I would say these two software aspects are the most important one besides the functional or specific business skills, but uh, culture and uh, want to grow or ability to grow. Right, right. Thanks, Ash. Uh, while we have a slew of questions to ask, considering there is a paucity of time, if I can take one question and uh, go around the panel uh, to each one of you, uh, <laughs> with uh, Gopal, Dinesh, Harsh, and Sandeep in that order, uh, if you consider yourself as a brand, uh, the brand CFO or the brand Gopal, the brand Dinesh, uh, what are the traits that is required and uh, how do you go about it? Well, in terms of, uh, well, brand as a person, I would say the most important thing is credibility. So right. that people know that when you are uh, addressing anyone or participating in a discussion, what they see of you is what they get. Right. That kind of, I think, improves the brand credibility. You know, a brand is nothing but it actually exemplifies certain qualities and capabilities. The second one is the capability bit. If right. you come well prepared with your thoughts, and yeah. if you are able to kind of add value to it, the, 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 the capability, uh, which is actually an overlay on the credibility, is a very dynamic and a powerful way of, uh, uh, you know, reaching out to people. Finally, a personal brand, I would right. only put it this way in the interest of time, a personal brand is nothing but how do you connect with the person on the other side who is listening to you. Yeah. You know, and th that can be done only honestly. Right. Excellent. Well said, Gopal. Dinesh, what are your thoughts? So I, I, I you know, I, the way I'd like to build my brand on this is not strictly as the CFO, but as a leader. Yeah, right. uh, because I, this, I think uh, CFOs are uniquely positioned uh, to really play roles which go beyond their function to impact both business and people uh, in a much wider remit. Right? right. And therefore, and therefore, my brand would fundamentally along the lines of what Gopal mentioned, I think trust, chemistry, credibility uh, are all essential ingredients to being able to uh, really be seen as a leader that people look up to. But in my mind, I think two ingredients of what uh, I would like my brand to stand for is right. uh, someone who sees me as uh, making a difference in all that I do right. and making a difference to them through what I do. Excellent. So it is the what and the how. Excellent. Well said, Dinesh. Uh, Harsh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so... Uh... The nation Gopal has captured what a personal brand would stand for. So I would directly jump in to say what uh, I would I would like to be perceived as uh, a leader who is um, showcasing credibility, trust, reliability, and the ability to think out of the box and uh, passion about uh, the business that we're working on. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, Sandeep, your views? Yeah, I think, um, you know, my view is that uh, uh, you know, it's slightly uh, different uh, that, you know, think about any other brand today. I mean, it's, you know, 60% of, 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 of what brand stands for is more perception and 40% is reality. I think uh, all individual brands are also like that. So I think my view is, uh, you know, you, you should you should have an assessment of, of who you are, essentially. Uh, what do you want to be known for? And, and most importantly, then triangular that would what people feel of you because you know sometimes what you do what you say is not seen or perceived the other way around so if you want to build a brand i think it'll be important to you know for you to uh, you know get that uh, assessment also done in terms of what other people see you standing for i think um, uh, you know the, you, you know we, and also we should also at the same point realize that you know you are or you i, I as an individual is not everyone's cup of tea so therefore what that, you know, is that I stand out for separately and distinctly from others is important to understand uh, and then build on that. I think trust, credibility, as you know, everybody said, I think those are to me fundamentals of, 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 of every human being. And, you know, that is what the good brands also stand for. If that, those bedrocks are not there, I think then, yeah, there is nothing to really think about and talk of. Excellent. Excellent. So, uh, as we move into rapid fire, I think uh, we had a pretty good session, uh, quite passionate to say, and uh, pretty open and candid. And eventually, 
maybe the answer is not about uh, one versus the other of a gatekeeper or a business partner or a strategist it's about everything is essential and critical but the world is moving towards uh, digital and data and how do you imbibe that and uh, inculcate sooner than later is also equally important and uh, the way in which uh, all of you talked about the brand uh, as you uh, is really really incredible in terms of what it needs to stand for so on that note uh, as we promised on the lighter side uh, we'll go to a rapid fire section uh, it has got about few choices that you can make uh, on the questions or it is about uh, who you would be or what do you want to be kind of questions uh so we'll take about a minute each i know that we are running behind time by about 4 uh, 5 minutes already so i'll try to make it fast uh i'll start with you dinesh uh if you're ready we can go ahead i'd like to say i am don't know what's coming my way though <laughs> <laughs> uh so if you could have become an actor in a movie who would it be and which movie the name is bond james bond lovely okay retail or geo at the center of both <laughs> that's a diplomatic <laughs> answer <laughs> uh, that because that's for my business actually yes. oh, sorry okay. right uh, the next one is uh, daft punk or dj snake i am sorry missed you on that one uh on the edm side is it daft punk <laughs> or dj snake Ah, uh, well, it's actually Martin Garrix and Dimitri Vegas. Ah, lovely. Okay, there is an out of the box. Uh, Lux or Life Boy? Ah, uh, can I pick differently? I'd say no. <laughs> okay. Uh, texting or talking? Talking. Always lovely. talking. Lovely, lovely. And if you are a brand, what would be your tagline? neighbors and be owners pride ah okay lovely thanks thanks uh, for the candid answers dinesh uh, i'll move to book <laughs> auto or auto ancillary no buyer on mute uh, auto or... ancillary auto ancillary because auto ancillary contains auto also ah okay lovely nice AR Rahman or Ilai Raja? Ilai Raja. Excellent. OTT or theater? Sorry. OTT or theater? Uh, theater any day. Oh, lovely. Who was your first crush? <laughs> well, the first crush was always a book, and ah, I can't okay. dare to say anything more than that, <laughs> even if I had one. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice, Gopal. Well said. uh what is the first thing comes to your mind when i say chennai the beach ah uh, okay lovely attitude or aptitude attitude always lovely thanks thanks gopal for those candid answers uh sandeep here we go uh growth or profit growth lovely organic or natural i think the answer lies somewhere in the middle uh okay uh starting it's organic uh you know when you mature it's in organic gas yeah, so okay raw pressure or hector <laughs> <laughs> i hope nobody said from raw or hector either <laughs> raw raw okay lovely so that's press. dna that's your dna fully coming out excellent uh mark bmw or audi uh, mark lovely what is the one thing that the world is oblivious about you oblivious about me uh, yeah. i think they they know only one side of me the other side is uh, you know only seen by my, by people closer to me at home so thank god they don't know that side okay if you become invisible and if you want to spy on someone who would it be i think this is not a question on this forum <laughs> um i would say donald trump okay lovely yeah quite relevant and pertinent one right now thanks thanks sandeep that's really really candid uh harish uh here we go for you i think uh, to start with i think uh, cfo or ceo 
Steve. Okay, lovely. Hard copy or Kindle? Hard copy. Lovely. Build or acquire? Built. Okay. Beach or a hill station? Hill station. Okay. Uh, work from home or back to office? Back to office. Lovely. One thing you dislike about being a CFO? I think audit. Okay. Lovely. Excellent. Excellent. Guys. So uh, that's all I had from my end. I think I thoroughly enjoyed this discussion. Alice, anything. Yeah, Swati. Kalis, we would like to do a rapid fire with you as well. I know we are short of time, but uh, we would like to know a little more about you as well. That's out of syllabus. That was not planned in this at all. Kalis, I've spent three working days making my script. So I request you to brace yourself and sit on the hot seat as well. Okay. Let me try. Okay. So the first question, um, if not a CFO, what would you have been? Uh, cricketer. Interesting. So since we are talking about cricket, uh, if you have to make your own IPL team, who would be your captain? Oh, MSD always. Nice. Uh, if you were given a million dollar, uh, you have to blow it up in 10 days. You can't save, you can't lend, you can't do charity and you can't invest. Uh, mind you, after 10 days, uh, the million dollar will go away from your account. So how would you blow it up? This is a tough one, yeah. You can't do anything, but still you have to spend. Maybe I can go and binge. I'm a foodie. So maybe I'll try to do that. Or uh, literally, I've only... million dollar? Yeah, yeah. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> I have a question for you, Kalis. Um, an idea that changed your life. An idea that changed my life. I think uh, uh, somewhere it goes back to what uh, Dinesh said. In early, uh, in my career also, it was always about... Uh, making a difference. So right from day one of my career. So that has been something instilled as a belief and everything that you do, try to make a difference and leave a legacy that the people whom you work with carry it along for a long period of time. Wow. Now next one is really difficult. During an international travel, who would you prefer to sit next to? MS Dhoni, Mr. Narayan Modi, Arnav Goswami, or is there a fourth one that you have in your mind? Uh, my wife is not watching, so otherwise, we'll definitely said my wife. That's the fourth choice that would have come in. <laughs> so let me pick the option close to my heart is MSD. Interesting. And now, the last question of this session, and this is for our audience as well. Okay. If you had an extra hour each day, how would you spend it? By working, by pursuing a hobby, sleeping, meditation, or yoga, or do nothing? I think actually this is for every panel member. I think off late, uh, we never had an opportunity to do nothing. So something or the other thing has been part of the life. So why not explore that? Interesting. Gopal? So my choice as well. Do nothing. Pursuing a hobby. Wow. Pursuing Dinesh. a hobby. Dinesh, Sandeep, Harsh. Yeah, I think pursuing a hobby is a... Yeah, a little bit more reading, I guess, so pursuing a party. Oh, excellent. Interesting. I think our audience is also uh, going by pursuing a hobby and 13% are with doing nothing. So it's no. a pretty much <laughs> close <laughs> to what panel members and audience think together. All right. So it was indeed a great rapid fire round. And thank you, everyone, for being such a sport. I hope you all enjoyed this as much as we did. And now uh, back to you, Kalis, for audience Q&A. Okay. Lovely. So let me take the opportunity to go through it. Uh, so I think I'll keep the questions open and maybe uh, any of the panelists can pick it up. Uh, how conflict with the board is managed and dealt with? So I'm sure maybe I'll make it a little bit more generic, not only board, but even in the executive committee or at leadership teams, there's always conflict that we face on a day-to-day -day basis. How do we manage and deal that? I'm, I mean, I can share from my experience, you know, and I've been, um, you know, I'm now I'm part of board for a few companies and earlier I was part of the management team on the other side. I think the one thing that has stood out for me and that has worked well is 
that uh, you know uh, one is you know planning your agenda i think that's clear that if you if you kind of know what you're going to bring up in the in the board meetings and you know which ones are the sticky ones i think you need to do a little bit of more uh, you know deeper effort of engaging with board members on the sidelines i know it's a little bit of a drag on time and effort but i think it's important to you know capture uh, you know the board members view because once you're in that meeting room and if anybody has a diverse view you know it's hard to pull back from that view uh, especially if you state it even in front of you know 15 other people so i think one thing i would say is engage 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 uh, not in the board meeting but prior to that and and drive consensus right there's another interesting question uh, why don't we see a lot of ca founding startups is it because of technical illiteracy how can that be changed risk appetite ah okay yeah absolutely yeah yeah fair fair point uh how do you really manage people in the team who are aged than you they bring in their own perspective on adaptability and may become confrontational and non cooperative how do you handle the situation well i would say that especially people who are more experienced and who want to be heard give that the opportunity to be heard so give your response after about counting 10 okay it works okay lovely what are the three things that cfos are currently concerned about i think it's it's a very basic uh, piece it goes back to the basics in times like this growth profit cash ah uh, okay lovely yeah very topical right right I'm right. sorry to interrupt you. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you know you're already busting our time. I'll just request you to take the last two questions from the audience. Okay. Uh, data evaluation, digital transformation, traditional FP and A to strategic FP and A. Wow. Overall, ensure, ensuring that us to finance function has got a seat in the table uh, through partnership or business. What are the other factors to build in high impact? Okay, let me simplify the question. beyond what we talked today on traditional fp and a data and digital transformation is there anything else that needs to be factored for a high high impact finance function i would say performance and talent yeah sorry yeah oh, right uh, I, i would say attitude also times have changed i we need to change as quickly as possible also. right But, uh, i would agree with dinesh as well right right uh the last question for the day what will be your advice to your team member in case he or she feels undervalued in the workplace i mean i i tried responding to that question so i can probably you know chip in on this one uh i think i mean for everything else you know human to human connection is about communication uh right. and if you don't do that enough uh you know either as a supervisor or as a team member i think then these kind of feelings are 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 so too much having said that when you run large teams you can't do that with everybody and therefore you have to have a process a structure which enables this i think that is most important in my view that you have to communicate with people and not just at the end of operational cycles right it's yeah. a, it's a long it's a long time you can't be having goal posts drawn out 12 months uh, down the road so i think at least what has worked for me and this is what g taught me as an organization you kind of do this more periodic i mean we used to do them quarterly check ins with our people and i understand where they stand and what do fail and what we feel about them and what other 360 you know around them feels especially at a leadership level and communicate them and build over a period of time uh by measuring and monitoring how they are shaping up so that's what i would say thanks thanks and i think it is and i think it is ever a time when that has come to the fore it's probably right now you know in the situation that we are currently going through because you can imagine people right at the farthest end of the team uh could possibly feeling this whole piece from the fomo effect right the fear of missing out right and if there is a time that we need to connect uh and connection therefore is the proxy of saying you are valued that's right. probably the time when we feel it even more now than ever before excellent okay great thanks thanks a lot everyone thanks harsh thanks gopal dinesh and sandeep uh, a varied panel bringing in fantastic perspective from various angles i really enjoyed the conversation I would like thank to you. thank Kali for yeah. uh, you know the, a, a good story and a good script is as good as the sutradhar. So uh, <laughs> I must thank uh, Kali for doing a fantastic job of uh, moderation and of course I think this is a very unique, uh, very very unique uh, interaction that I've had. So compliments to the entire team, including Nitin. But Kali, hats off. Thanks, thanks. Yes. Thank you, Kali.
Thanks, thanks, Dinesh. Yeah. Thanks, sir. Second that, and thanks once again to the Native team for really been hosting all of us. And it's been a fantastic and absolutely an enjoyable interaction. So thank you very much for setting this up. Thank you. Thanks, folks. Thank you. And that was an indeed an insightful session, giving us a lot of clarity and direction on how today's finance professional can look at transformation, which is a constant process towards growth. Thank you, Dinesh, Gopal, Harsh, Sandeep, for sharing your perspectives with us today, and Kalis for being an amazing moderator. To our attendees, we appreciate the time you have taken out to be here today, and we hope you have enjoyed the session as much as we did hosting it. We look forward to hosting more such webinars. Stay tuned, stay safe, have a great weekend.